Hey everybody, here we are. We're back. I'm back. Uh, after a delay, um, after a, a quite prolonged delay of confusion, uh, existential dread, um, uh, general fear about the state of the world you can wrap those up and put a bow on it uh things things are pretty crazy nowadays but but even i don't know more so a, a personal rut here and so i was thinking what i could do to get back out there and hit on the idea of lowering the bar of entry. So that's why I am currently recording this at 2.22 a.m. Uh, so I might be quasi-conscious, a little bit delirious, so my apologies if things start to get weird and... Uh, here we are. I'm just gonna. I was thinking this. This is an episode of of Casually Curious of the Distillation series. Um, so I'm gonna be reading some quotes and approaching distillations with a little more leniency, uh, a little more, a little more fun. Um, I guess maybe just thinking about it more like like live streaming what I'm up to, what I'm reading. You know. Uh, that sort of thing. Um, and then, you know, the idea is if there's anyone out there who takes an interest in this sort of crap, then it's your lucky day. Okay. Here we are. Um, so I'm going to be reading uh, some essential Kierkegaard. I think it's uh this might be actually from a letter that he sent someone uh i'll give the citation the direct the you know specific citation in the in the notes um but it turns out kierkegaard has some interesting things to say about existential dread i guess i don't know if that's exactly uh the way to articulate um articulate it yeah. but i've i've been i found it relevant to some of the things i've been going through um the the um being in being in stasis you know uh, paralysis uh anxiety about moving forward, uh, being focused on the wrong sorts of things. Uh, and I guess you'll, you'll see that, uh, as I start reading, but, um, yeah, so it's, I guess that might be part of, part of a change that I'm experimenting with here, which is to, If, I, if I'm reading this kind of stuff anyway on my own, might as well share it. And I think it'll it'll sort of two birds with one stone, you could say, because it's a self exploration. While hitting the objective that I need to hit which is just taking this opportunity seriously the opportunity being YouTube and you know it sounds sort of silly when you when you first say it um, thinking remembering back to YouTube's origins and but it's really it's really you know 
come into its own and it's obviously having a moment i mean 2018 we're we're really seeing these youtube youtubers and influencers really kind of have an impact and uh so why not why not add this to the sum of human knowledge and something i have to keep in mind is uh part of that is, is intimidating but at the same time i have to keep remembering that no one's going to watch this and <laughs> no one not too many eyeballs on on the other videos we've uploaded and uh hopefully that'll change but um i have to keep that in mind because you know you get you get caught up in in imagining that you know it's it's your your best friend that's listening or your you know your your friends that are listening to every single thing you're saying and they're going to be you know judging you and like giving you shit f about it the next day or something but you know it's just throwing it out into the ether all right without further ado uh as usual my preamble goes way too long and probably turns off the one person that decided to tune in and give me a shot and they heard that they were like no nah. too too much okay all right all right stay with us one one guy all right so Kierkegaard Soren Kierkegaard here's what he has to here's what he has to say but when I try to get clear about my life everything looks different just as it takes a long time for a child to learn to distinguish itself from objects and thus for a long time disengages itself so little from its surroundings that it stresses the objective side and says for example me hit the horse so the same phenomenon is repeated in a higher spiritual sphere. I therefore believed that I would possibly achieve more tranquility by taking another line of study, by directing my energies toward another goal. I might have succeeded for a time in banishing a certain restlessness, but it probably would have come back more intense, like a fever after drinking cold water. Uh, I, think, I think I've heard of that uh, idea of kids not being able to distinguish the environment their surroundings from their own uh will so they sort of think that their actions directly uh cause the things that they see in the environment and things that they in, in the in the environment that are contingent and not not under their control uh, are the result of of their own actions something they did uh, it's called uh, yeah, magical thinking um, is the name that psychologists have for it uh, so I think it's interesting is he's talking about this where you sort of lose um, you lose the distinction between between the dividing lines of causation between uh, you know, your own self agency and autonomy and everything and 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 the environment and the things that are going on around you um and that that idea makes sense to me uh when he's when he's talking about uh you know expecting tranquility to be found in the environment itself uh conflating a deeper tranquility with uh, the environment itself or the the uh, lines of inquiry. Uh, all right, so next section. Quote, um, <clears throat> quote, what I really need is to get clear about what I am to do, not what I must know, except insofar as knowledge must precede every act. What matters is to find my purpose to see what it really is that God wills that I shall do. The crucial thing is to find a truth that is truth for me, to find the idea for which I am willing to live and die. Of what use would it be to me to discover a so-called objective truth, to work through the philosophical systems so that I could, if asked, make critical judgments about them, 
could point out the fallacies in each system, of what use would it be to me to be able to develop a theory of the state, getting details from various sources and combining them into a whole and constructing a world I did not live in, but merely held up for others to see? Of what use would it be to me to be able to formulate the meaning of Christianity, to be able to explain many specific points, if it had no deeper meaning for me and for my life? And the better I was at it, the more I saw others appropriate the creations of my mind, the more tragic my situation would be, not unlike that of parents who in their poverty are forced to send their children out into the world and turn them over to the care of others. This is one of my favorite sections here. Of what use would it be to me for truth to stand before me, cold and naked, not caring whether or not I acknowledged it, making me uneasy rather than trustingly receptive. I certainly do not deny that I still accept an imperative of knowledge and that through it men may be influenced, but then it must come alive in me, and this is what I now recognize as the most important of all. This is what my soul thirsts for, for as the African deserts thirst for water. This is what is lacking, and this is why I am like a man who has collected furniture, rented an apartment, but as yet has not found the beloved to share life's ups and downs with him. But in order to find that idea, or to put it more correctly, to find myself, it does no good to plunge still further into the world. That was just what I did before. I just think that that's powerful. It's a powerful critique of, I think, the imperative of knowledge that that he mentions, which is seen to be sort of the ultimate value, I think, especially being into philosophy and constantly thinking about ideas and reading different philosophers and the whole system building enterprise, uh, which maybe not so much of late with this sort of specialized post positivist and, um, you know, the commentary and all that sort of thing. Um, you know, maybe there aren't as many systems being built in contemporary philosophy, academic philosophy at least, but um, it's interesting to hear someone uh, reject the appeal to that and to identify that process as being misguided if what you're searching for is tranquility or something something deeper, um, you know, something to live and die for, which intimates to me that uh, that it, what he's getting at is something something with purpose, uh, something at that at that level of analysis, uh, something that is able to come alive inside you, and that being the most important of all, that that's powerful. Um, And it's uh, food for thought, I guess. I don't know. I I, I can I can see uh, my own some of my own issues chasing the different lines of inquiry down to the ground, thinking that each one is going to lead to whatever answer it is that I've been looking for um, 
or something along those lines. You know, uh, that's a whole Pandora's box that I'll not open because then I'll be talking for for hours. Um, but there was a lot. There's a lot um, relevant here. I think to also just people who are who are used to thinking about philosophy and different system builders and that sort of thing. Um, an idea that you can embody seems like a good an ideal situation I guess you could say is that the system you believe to be true ends up also according to the deepest senses of your lived experience or a lived experience or <coughs> or even you know something congruent with your soul or you know something like that um, something that corresponds or is you know a theory that or something that you know, has, has the, the, the actions of a quote unquote, um, soul integrated to it so that you can, you can live it. So you could live, live the, the idea itself. All right. Before I run the risk of rambling, uh, I'm going to end this one there. Maybe I'll do another separate video for for, for some more there's I think there's one more from from this reading all right